So now I'd like to invite Tony, if you could come on down. Um, here you go. So what we're going to do is something less formal. We'll just stand over here so we don't get... There you go. So we're just going to do Q&A. So uh, I'm going to ask some uh, questions. Uh, this will be based around the weblog that Tony wrote. So if you go to TED Summit, go to the blog about the uh, SMS value chain being broken. It's an excellent weblog. Recommend you read it. Uh, so you can read that while we're doing the Q&A, because uh, we'll be sort of firing out to the audience any questions. So I'll kick off with the obvious one, which is, Tony, why did you found Nexmo? Um. So in the, in the beginning, why we founded Nexmo is, is really to lower the barriers to entry for developers to innovate uh, with communication. And uh, Roger Voice application we saw this morning is a great example of, of how we were able to lower that, that barrier. And, and that barrier is not only about uh, the technology. It's not only about getting easy to use APIs. It's also about time to market. Uh, I don't know if you remember, five years ago, without, before this Telco API existed, it used to take six months to a year to do anything uh, of that sort. And there's also a business model problem because these, the carriers would put you know, high fees, fixed fees, and, and uh, not everyone would, would afford this innovation. Uh, the second reason why we, we founded Nexmo is to solve the end-to-end -end quality um, and scalability issue across the value chain, and we're going to talk about it next in the, you know, why the SMS value chain is broken. But essentially, when these uh, developers or these enterprise do the heavy lifting to connect to the carrier, they cannot scale in quality and, and, and uh, geography very easily. Uh, you have things like latency, the reliability issues, uh, but there's always somewhere in the world, there's a country that's going to change a regulation and that's going to require the app developer to customize that application to each country, and therefore, it doesn't scale. And that's why, in the first place, we created Nexmo. Excellent. And we can see just the volume of usage in terms of it's met a key need to uh, so many developers. Uh, so let's move on. So in your weblog, you identified five key issues. Now, I'm interested both from how Nexmo solves it, but also from your perspective as a broader industry, how could we potentially solve these issues? So kicking off with the first one, which is latency. Yeah, be before talking into the individual problems yeah. along the value chain, uh, let's take a step back and look at this communication value chain. And it's, it's very much like the airline industry. It's a hub and spoke model. Uh, and, and because it's hub and spoke model, it's not fit for this business critical communication. Uh, so uh, Im imagine a message can cross uh, 10, 20 different platforms before reaching the final destination. It can do multiple rounds ar around the world uh, in terms of uh, jurisdiction to finally reach the carrier. So that's the core issue of when, when it was designed, it was designed for person-to-person -person communication. And as a result of that uh, multi-hub structure, uh, you have things like latency. Uh, latency not only on uh, you know, each platform at latency, but also you have queues. Uh, you, know, you have capacity issue on each, on each hub leading to bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. um, the same issue of hubs, multiple hubs, leads to deliverability issue. Let's say you want to send a Unicode message and one of the platforms doesn't support Unicode. It's going to fall on the floor. Uh, you have um, uh, data insight uh, problematic. Uh, we all know the every time you send a message, you get a handset delivery confirmation. But most of the time, they, you get them late. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the time, they are faked uh, because some spam filters are not ideal or not perfect. Uh, so how do you know that that communication has, has been effective? Uh, there's also security risks. Um, uh, we've seen in, in recent years uh, some jurisdiction have certain privacy concerns in, around data and they want the data to stay in their country. Uh, I can you know, name Singapore and Germany as two examples. But when you have a message that is uh, running across the globe multiple times, well, uh, the security uh, policy gets lost in translation. So, so how, how did we address that? So at Nexmo, as we said, first we, we exist to lower the barrier to entry and that's, we use APIs to replace traditional telco protocols. Uh, but also we solve the end-to-end -end quality issue across the value chain. Uh, so the first thing we've done in the last, in the last four years, we've built what we call a direct-to-carrier network. So we are uh, either one or zero hop away maximum from any carrier in the world. Uh, that improves latency, give us more control over uh, regulation uh, so that we can abstract that as well for our customers uh, and improve the deliverability. Uh, but it's not enough because a carrier one point of failure uh, can, can, can break. Uh, so we started building redundancies across this value chain and, 
and we start gathering feedback from end users. Every time we send, let's say, one-time password, be it a message or a phone call, we know whether that, that, that uh, call or message resulted in a positive uh, result for the end user. So we gather millions of data points per day, and that feeds into our algorithms to make sure that the quality is consistent uh, for the developer. Uh, and that's how we solve that problem. Excellent. No, that's clear. And I feel the pain in Hub and Spoke, which I have to travel on very regularly uh, in the US. Uh, we, the radar was down in New York, so JFK, uh, LaGuardia, EWR had a ground stop for about three hours. And just that ground stop meant that arrival flights, I think it was like four and a half hour delay. So yeah, it's, yep. we see it in the real world in a number of analogies. And, and we do that not because it's fun. It's actually not fun at all, building this massive carrier network and manage it. We do it because it makes sense for our customers. Let's say you have a big brand that is trying to acquire a user. They spend $30 um, on, on that acquisition cost, and, and the message gets caught in a queue yeah. and gets delivered in two hours. That user is lost. That spending is lost. So we do that so that this communication become valuable and effective for our customers. Yep. No. Absolutely. So just, just sort of jumping around those five issues. Um, you know, I, I use uh, SMS services uh, uh, for a number of, sort of ATP applications, and one of the big problems I have is visibility. You fire it off, and it's almost you know, getting your know, feedback from somebody that says, Alan, you sent, said you sent this, and I didn't receive it. So I'm very interested in how can we solve this visibility issue. Yeah, 80% of the tickets we receive is about that, and, 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 and the problem is, is really getting lost in translation about getting the data from the final carrier to your application. Uh, you know, every SMSC would have a different error code, mm -hmm. and, and, and since there's multi-hop issue, uh, there's the mapping of these error code at the end of the, you know, number 10 hop, you know, you, you're not going to be able to, be, to, to know anything about what's happening. So that's why we, when we get closer to the carrier, we really go deeper into mapping the right error code so that people know, or customer developers know, you know, what's going on. Exactly. And I think that is the key point in terms of direct to carrier, because it, you know, it evolves that, you know, avoids that lost in translation, but there is a significant investment involved in creating that direct to carrier uh, network, because most developers can't afford it. I mean, there's like upfront fees, a whole host of compliance regulations that are local to each country. So it's a big, barrier just to build that. So uh, maybe um, compliance. This remains just, uh, you know, especially in Asia, just unbelievable. I'm interested to get your perspective around how both Nexmo, but also the broader industry can solve this compliance issue because that essentially means a lot of times stuff gets lost in the filters that operators point, put in because of regulation. Yeah, I think this is uh, one of the biggest threat uh, for the growth of the A2P market, actually. And uh, how, how we solve it is we, we abstract that for the developers. So let's say, take an example, in, in, in China, you cannot send a certain type of traffic. We filter it on our end. We don't let the customer make mistakes. Uh, in France, if you send it with a, a numeric sender, you get a 500 euro fine. So we, we don't let that happen. Uh, so we, we abstract that on our end. So the developer have, uh, need to develop one code, and then they can scale globally. Um, and, and, and we've been reactive to the industry. Uh, you know, there's a lot of changes happening on, on, a, on a weekly basis. And, uh, and honestly, I don't know how the industry is going to solve it. I think, I think it's really about um, uh, uh, being, being more um, critical about, you know, what, what makes sense for the end users. And, and, and a lot of the time, it gets really political in certain countries. So uh, um, I think this having this abstraction layer makes sense so that the developer doesn't need to change their application every week uh, when there's something new happening in a certain country. So essentially what you're saying is there's no control of the regulators. They're going to do balmy things. Therefore, we just need an aggregator in the middle to basically cope with the balmy uh, behavior of uh, local regulators. That's uh, the best way we found so far. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to get into GSMA, ITU, or anything like that, because then Dean will start asking questions on that. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, I mean, from your weblog, uh, where you went through those five issues, I'm just interested, you know, do you have any interesting case studies, interesting sort of customer stories you know, that just exemplify some of those problems that you've hit in just day-to-day -day operations? Um, yeah, so we're going to have a customer here tomorrow, Zenly, uh, talking about how they use our Verify API. Our Verify API is a two-factor authentication API that solves a lot of these problems. 
um, and, and the result is there. They get uh, uh, over 10% uh, increased conversion. Uh, so imagine you're, you're, that's 10% more users, that's 10% more um, uh, uh, re return on your marketing investment. Yeah. So, so we see that uh, at least uh, you know two-digit improvement uh, on the on the impact of that communication across the globe, and it varies by country. For instance, Latin America is 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 very uh, challenging. So here you can get 20 percent uh, increase, where Europe it's pretty stable. You get maybe two or three percent increase. Yeah, and that's a key point. Again, those regional regional variations have a big impact around effectiveness. That's a good point. So maybe moving on from uh, the challenges that we're seeing, and the fact is. It is a problem, and I think, you know, for me, it's one of the biggest concerns. At the moment, SMS has an unbelievable reach. U.S. government uses it because it can reach over 90% of the population more effective than email, but we sort of, as an industry, aren't, you know, it's sort of letting it die on the vine by not really trying to solve some of these key challenges. So moving on from that, I'm interested, you're far more than just an SMS API provider. So just interested in some of the other APIs you provide and why you provide them. Yeah, so um, we, we started with messaging because we really found a, pro a real problem to solve, and then we started adding new APIs based on customer needs. So, the, so we have a, a fully-fledged voice API for, for two-way communication with the largest reach of inbound numbers, over 100 countries in the world. Um, and, and we have, we mentioned the Verify API. It's a, it's a high-level API to verify phone numbers. It's very simple for the developers. They send us a phone number, and, and, and we even... Uh, make sure that they don't pay if we don't verify. So it's we remove the risk out of the network uh, for them uh, and make it consistent. We have Number Insight API that provide more information about phone numbers, uh, uh, validity, uh, uh, presence, roaming, so that customers can better uh, customize the, the, the communication to the context. And, and most recently, we've announced our chat app API. Uh, so we believe that chat apps like Viber, WeChat, uh, are the next carriers of communication and, and yeah. business to consumer communication is happening on these chat apps in emerging countries. It's just a matter of time, they're gonna come in, in developed countries. Uh, and we enabled that, that brands uh, like KLM, like UNICEF, uh, can actually uh, interact with these users in a very intimate way uh, over WeChat, over Facebook Messenger, uh, in a similar way they interact over SMS or voice. Yeah, and I think when you do that announcement, for me, I, you know, I made a point of highlighting that because I think that's a key trend, that unless we solve, these SMS issues, the market's just going to move to platforms that just are so much easier and just work globally. So yeah, I think that was you know, very, uh, you know, it, it was leading because nobody else had made such an announcement. I think we're going to see lots of others follow on from that. Now, one of the challenges is, of course, as you mentioned, the SMS network was built for person to person. And some operators love to put issues around, oh no, the ratio of outgoing to ingoing, clamp it down. So you've got to be so careful about ratios on interactions. And what we've seen in the US is the appearance of 1-800-SMS that supposedly solves some of these issues. But of course, it's never done in a functional way uh, because there's all these legacy businesses. So I'm interested in your perspective on 1-800-SMS. Can we make it work within the US? Do you think it's something that could work internationally? Yeah, so consumers love to interact with uh, their vendors, their, their advertisers through, through, through text messages, right? We've seen that earlier in one of the videos. And, um, uh, and the toll-free uh, SMS-capable numbers in the US are great for that. Uh, however, it's, it's a very US-centric uh, offering because very few countries in the world support toll-free uh, SMS-capable numbers. And, and I think it's not going to happen outside the U.S. because, as I said before, this consumer-to-business communication in emerging countries have moved to chat apps. Yeah. And, um, you know, like what happened in Africa, we moved directly, f you know, we didn't even build a fixed-line network, we moved to mobile network. Yeah. That's going to happen uh, on consumer-to-brand to, uh, to communication. It's going to be over, over chat app. Um, so uh, it, 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 it remains a very U.S.-centric uh, offering. And, yeah. And good luck getting, you know, convince the regulators in other countries to, to offer that in the next five years. And if they do it in the next five years, the chat apps are going to take over. And that leads to uh, the last question before we open it up to the audience. The chat apps versus SMS. <coughs> Taking a developed market view and, and, and sort of developing market view separately, will, in the limit, it all move to IP? Or do you think there'll be coexistence for, let's say, the next 10 plus years? Uh, there will be coexistence for a very long time because the context of using A2P versus chat app is completely different. 
So you use A2P as a brand or as a developer when you don't know what, what application the user is having, what phone they have, you only have their phone number. So, so and A2P have found the niche in that context and, and that niche is increasing because you know, there's more need to use your phone number on online platforms. Um, so it is, it is completely complementary and we don't see any, uh, any substitution uh, so you can use them in different contexts. No, that's a very good point. So we'll open it up and Dean's got his hand up so I'll go over and take Dean but please, we've got to stop Dean asking all the questions, okay? On that last point about A to P, um, do you see a risk that iOS and Android push notifications are going to claim more and more of that market, particularly if there's a bra if there's a link to a browser? Yeah, I think the uh, it could be, uh, assuming if they if they have access to the phone number as as a if they use the phone number. Uh, as, as an identity for people. And, and that's one of the reasons why A2P and the carrier are making uh, revenue from that growing market is because they own the phone number and the identity of the person. Uh, so if that identity shifts uh, towards uh, the, the, the OS providers, then yes, there is, a, there is a threat where push notification can actually become a substitute uh, for A2P messaging, but it's not the case today. And then this will be the last question. I'm going to try and phrase this question in such a way that I'm not complaining. Um, but uh, if the thesis is that the value chain is broken, um, given the, I mean, I mean, say in Australia, it's been about 18 years since you could do um, intercarrier SMS. And, and, and that opportunity created, created a value model for carriers to monetize SMS based on so many cents per message, which drove investment in their infrastructures and SMSC platform fees to the major vendors and such. Um, given the, all the things we've spoken about this morning, um, is it just possible that there will never be any incentive whatsoever for the, any carriers, any other providers, just to provide SMS? Because there's no, there's no financial incentive anymore because everything's either in plan or it's free. Um, as, mu as much as many, you know, two-factor authentication and other business needs are driving, you know, the use of SMS, um, but we're all being limited by the fact that, you know, it's kind of sucky in terms of costs. So, I mean, is it possible that without some new way for carriers to monetize SMS, there's going to be never any incentive whatsoever to fix any of this stuff? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because uh, carriers did two type of investment. They did a huge investment in their person-to-person -person, uh, SMS infrastructure, and they did very little investment in their A2P uh, messaging infrastructure. And, and today they face a problem. Uh, you know, P2P uh, uh, traffic is going down, is being, is being cannibalized by chat apps. So uh, and they have A2P growing really fast. So they underinvested in A2P and they overinvested in P2P. So, so I think it's, it's a question to the carrier, can you move, can you shift some of that uh, unused capacity from P2P to A2P and, and, and enable you know, an easier, um, highly redundant, uh, you know, less, more capacity on A2P uh, as that market continues to grow? Well. A2P, they are getting revenue from A2P, for sure. Uh, brands are willing to pay, companies, enterprises are willing to pay for A2P because of that niche use case where you want to communicate with a user and you don't know if they have a, a, what, what device they have, what app they have, uh, whether they have push notification enabled or not. So that, that niche is there and it's growing. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's going to be, whether they're going to feel it on their P&L, you know, that's, that's a key question. How big is going to be uh, we believe A2P is going to overtake P2P revenue like this year. Uh, will, will they be receptive to shifting some of that investment into A2P because they already invested uh, in the P2P infrastructure that's becoming unutilized? So that's an excellent point. Thank you. So two things before we finish. And crutch, sorry, we're out of time. But uh, Tony, you'll be around here till tomorrow? Excellent, so you'll have a chance to catch up. They've got to stand over in the exhibition area. So first of all, to congratulate Tony in being a six-week-old father of a baby girl. Congratulations, Tony. And for an excellent Q&A. That was great. Thank you so much, Tony.